This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at the new movie, Britney Runs a Marathon. Two new documentaries, one about the time-honored musical Fiddler on the Roof, and another about music icon Linda Ronstadt. We'll check out some classic time-honored back-to-school flicks and look at the latest version of Shaft, along with my interview with its stars, Samuel L. Jackson, Jesse T. Usher, and Richard Roundtree. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose, and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly Critics Roundtable show, where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are Lisa Rossman from Science and Sirens, Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby, and Justine Browning from Entertainment Weekly. Let's start out with a look at a few new films hitting theaters this month, beginning with Britney Runs a Marathon, about a woman who wants to turn her life around. Let's take a look at a clip. We have a bunch of membership options okay. to fit all your fitness needs with rates as low as $129 a month. I'm sorry, I thought you said um, as low and then the $129 for a month. <laughs> you do know that people can go outside though and just be outside and like do things. Absolutely. And that's the same fitness experience. You, know, you pay for our facilities. But going for a run outside, that is zero. And then this one is, what is it again? Justine, tell us about Britney Runs a Marathon. Well, Jillian Bell stars as a woman who's determined to change her unhealthy lifestyle, and she decides to devote herself to training for the New York City Marathon. And the film Who isn't just it? about a woman's uh, physical transformation, time. but it's about her internal one as well. And though the premise is so simple, I think it tackles a lot of really big I themes, such as self-acceptance, body image, really the dangers like of inspired. social media and the toll that can take. It's witty, it's funny, it's deeply moving from start to finish. There's a great supporting cast that really livens things up. And it's great to see Belle, who's been relegated to supporting roles, really get to shine here. She actually went through quite a transformation shooting this film, lost 40 pounds. It's great to see her carry a project and really shine. It feels like a documentary almost in that way because we're looking at somebody who did transform her body and, and her life and and she's kind of Amy Schumer light and I don't mean that as no, a no I would disagree she's no no Amy I don't Schumer mean that deep. as I, I don't Amy mean Schumer that as deep. a diss I mean it's like this has not got the big broad laughs of an Amy Schumer movie but it has a lot of the pathos and she mm -hmm. delivers them well I also think uh, one of the uh, you mentioned the supporting cast I'm going to barbecue his name I'm sure it's Lukash Mdukar Lukash Mdukar uh, okay I, I thought he's he was great. hilarious he's great so good. really funny he plays her love interest and he's so smart he's a nice jumping off point. I have to be honest I was reading this film because I was like, oh great, a movie about a woman who should like who gets fat shamed. Like that was my stereotype of what I thought it would be. It's such an amazing film. Like it's so smart, it's so subtle. I mean there's a lot of things about this film that I just didn't expect. Like it starts off with broad humor and then it ends up really deepening into something that frankly Amy Schumer has never even approached in her career. Well here's the thing, you know, the first 15, 20 minutes or so are like kind of broad comedy. And when the movie when she starts getting serious about her weight loss and her running, um, I started getting a little, you know, less interested in her, in the character and the film. Uh, in other words, when it got more real, you, you when it started, got deep, when it brought, like, yeah. when it achieved some <laughs> resonance. At the end of the movie, and Justine and a friend of hers, we were all at the same screening, I started talking to Justine when the movie ended, and she's crying, and so is her Thanks, friend. Yeah. I was crying and, and, and so And I'm much. like, are we watching <laughs> the same movie? Because it didn't tears. have the emotional resonance to me that it obviously had to. <laughs> In which Neil introduces himself as Rain Man, and we all agree. No, but I mean, you I, like the funny Indian guy, so that's the important yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the performances are quite good across the board. I yeah. think that Jillian Bell is tremendous. So good. I think it's a average movie I don't think it's as great no, there are as some way above average scenes I'll give you one she actually starts to do some fat shaming of someone else at a birthday party yeah that's a great that, scene. The, the dialogue that's is so, so well written and everybody it, it just pounds on her in a way that uh, it feels no, felt movie really is about realistic taking to personal me. responsibility and not feeling sorry for yourself it's yeah. a really right. smart film I thought it was okay but not as great okay as we got that point all right anyway <laughs> moving on let's check out the new documentary Linda Ronstadt the sound of my voice Lisa Okay, so full disclosure, you guys know I'm pretty sick of music biopics, and I've never been a huge Linda Ronstadt fan. So when I say I love this documentary, that's actually saying something. You know, obviously it's about Linda Ronstadt, and it captures so many different things at once. It starts out with a pretty interesting look at the 60s and 70s community of L.A. rock that she made her name in initially. And then it looks at sort of all the different worlds that Linda Ronstadt moved through, and I didn't realize how many different, like, genres she killed. Mexican music. She 
she was in an operetta that she was amazing in. And there's just amazing interviews in this film, like Bonnie Raitt and Neville Brothers. Like, Dolly Parton, and I have the thing where if Dolly's on screen, I start to cry. So I basically was so blown away by what a wonderful person she was and what a useful documentary this was. Yeah, I mean, it really is a celebration of one of the most exciting and defining periods in music history. Yes, you get a great overview of the LA music scene at the time. And yes, wonderful to see Dolly Parton, people like Emmy Lou Harris, these great early performances from those artists, and also just realizing what a powerhouse she truly was, and I don't think she receives enough recognition for, and when she tackles Latin music, and seeing what a groundbreaking thing that was at the time. And her also, identity is a Mexican-American, which doesn't get talked about Which she about never, much. nobody talked about yeah. until this thing was yeah. on. Like, I can see Trump going, I used to like her, don't anymore. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the, real, the real headline here is, oh, like, God. how much she did for women in general. I mean, Cameron yes. Crowe comes on totally. a couple of times and says, this is a woman who was, you know, five platinum Absolutely. albums in a row, could sing anything she wanted to, and got the respect of men and women in an industry that was dominated by men at the time. And also, she was a really good sister to her friends. Absolutely. People like Emmylou Harris, who, who yeah. lost somebody, who she said, move in with me. The other huge headline here is you could apparently, in the 60s, rent a place on Santa Monica on the beach for $80 a month. Yeah, that right. blew me away. Oh, and she went out with Jerry Brown. She went well, out, and that's uh, Unlike, and unlike you, Lisa, I'm a big fan of Linda yeah. Ronstadt, and nothing would please me more than to watch uh, people wax poetic about her and listen to her old recordings all day uh -oh, long. But? And that movie, no, I oh, love, good. I love the movie. It's love an amazing, it. uh, you know, it, it's a lovely tribute to a singer with an amazing voice and um, and an amazing spirit. I yeah, mean, and look, I that. did know that she look. She decided like, she's got this rock career, and she wants to like work with Nelson Riddle, who was Frank Sinatra's arranger. And they're going, so you know, like you're going to kill your career or do a, an album of Mexico, which is the highest selling Spanish, um, you know, singing right. album of all time. And I knew all of that, but it's just I think this woman is a powerhouse, and her struggles in a male-dominated music world was very pointedly uh, looked at in this film. And I, I love the documentary, it's and I love really Linda Ronstadt. I, I truly. Truly really do. When will I be loved? All right, moving on. There's another new doc called Fiddler, Miracle of Miracles. Bill, you want to tell us about it? Well, speaking of <laughs> inspiring traditional uh, music, and we were talking about Linda Ronstadt, this is completely different. This is, uh, as you said, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, the original. Broadway show that then becomes a major motion picture. And man, this maybe tells you a little bit more than you ever wanted to know about Tevia or any of the people that have played uh, him. But I found it fascinating. The late Hal Prince is in it. The film is dedicated to him. He was asked to direct originally. He got Jerome Robbins involved in it. And that was because he said, you're the guy who did West Side Story. You can make everyone move. And that's what this needs. It needs heart. It needs to move. Uh, so we see this thing from Detroit, where they tried it out originally. We end up at Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, wedding where he recreates one of the scenes okay. with his new father-in-law. This movie talks about everything you've ever wanted to know about Fiddler on the Roof and I enjoyed it completely. You know, I didn't expect to cry while I watched this documentary. You did a lot of crying Every this movie week. this week, we were bawling. No, but for me, I mean, I've always loved Fiddler, but to get, it, it wasn't, this documentary doesn't just give you the inside scoop, which I appreciate, but it also looks at the resonance and the relevance of this kind of story right now. I mean, not just the Jewish diaspora, but any story about the immigration experience and the outsider experience and how this musical has, as Lin-Manuel Miranda, like, you know, ex exemplifies, right. like, it relates to so many different people. I love that take it to Japan and the Japanese go, are they going to get it in America? It's, it's, it's like, it's really our story. <laughs> exactly. Seeing, seeing what the show has meant to so many different people across all walks of life was really impactful, but also seeing what went into the creation of these now God iconic musical right. numbers. My favorite scene being the creation of the bottle the dance. Show. Right. Okay, well, I have to tell you that I only found about 15 humankind. minutes of this documentary to be interesting, and those 15 minutes are comprised of the following. I really like the Jerome Robbins subplot about the fact that this guy was this mean, hated guy by everybody that worked with him, right. and he demeaned everybody, like when they were, you know, rehearsing this thing. But yet everybody goes, "Oh, but I'd work with him again in a second. I thought that was. You know, that's how we feel about you. That, that <laughs> is a naysayer <laughs> Absolutely. Seat. And then the I like the seat. part about uh, the fact that, as you mentioned, Bill, that this thing bombed when it was tried out, you know, right. out of town when they were trying out. That was interesting. But it's all over the place. They got the Yiddish version. They got a high school production, yeah. and it. 
it meanders around, and uh, I was not really thrilled with the documentary. I think you'd be much better suited to see an actual production of Fiddler on the Roof. I think it's what? too long. We've that... all seen an actual production of Fiddler on the Roof. That's what makes this more interesting. I really think Neil took negative pills. This no. You are all sunset and no sunrise. All right, anyway, uh, <laughs> Loose is the name of a new drama starring Kelvin Harrison Jr. as a high school senior who was adopted at age seven from a war-torn African country by Naomi Watts and Tim Roth, who gave him a loving household. It seems that Luce has taken full advantage of his opportunities in America, and he's even on a path to be school valedictorian. But his history te teacher, played by Octavia Spencer, suspects that something isn't right. First, she reads a paper that Luce writes where he advocates violence and murder to solve certain situations. Then she discovers illegal fireworks in his locker. Luce denies everything. His parents and the high school principal are supportive of him, and we, the audience, don't know whether he's lying or not. The movie raises a lot of timely questions. Maybe the panel can give us some answers. Lisa, you've given lectures on this movie. I have. Why don't you try to give us uh, some uh, answers okay, well, to this? I thing. feel like the key to this film is that it was a play first. And in general, that's not a compliment for me when you can tell that a film has been a play. And it's not a compliment when I say that about this one. It's It raises a lot of interesting questions, but I don't feel like any of the characters are actually fleshed out much. I don't care about them. It feels more intellectually driven than um, passionate in any real way. And as the film ends, it, like you said, there's a lot of unanswered questions, which is okay. On one level, I admire that it doesn't try to neatly tie up its points, but there's a big sense of, I don't actually care about anything that just transpired. See, I saw the film weeks ago and it still stayed with me. I immediately called up a friend who had seen the film before I did because I had so many questions and I was just burning to discuss it and I haven't felt that in a while and I, I disagree. I think that the theatrical tension being preserved is actually a good thing. This is so uncomfortable to watch and I think important to note that the director, Julia Sona, he was born in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. He ended up growing up in Arlington, Virginia uh, where this film is set and I think his voice is a really interesting one because this film raises so many questions about you know, the myth of the model immigrant and the dangers of tokenism. And the more I ruminated on this film, I think the more it started to, to mean that the tension Look, is unreal. It's fine to have unanswered questions, but not when the script is giving you misdirection yes. and not telling you what yes. these people are really yep. thinking or yep. saying. There yep. are some really frustrating times yep. in this movie where you go, hey, you, tell him that. You know that and you know that. Why aren't you guys comparing notes? This is ridiculous. And Octavia mm -hmm. Spencer's character uh, doesn't make has, any sense. It doesn't because doesn't she's done sense. this before. What she's doing to this character that never comes into play. It starts to a, a girlfriend is brought in, and then and they're it goes gonna, nowhere. They're gonna you're right. There's a lot yeah, there's of a really confusing red herrings in this direction. Yeah. I'm, 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 I think I'm, that I think Justine's point is so well taken that it raises great questions. Yeah, yeah. there are a lot of good big ideas and here. tokenism and the kind of pressure that people feel in those situations. But I don't think the film adequately tackles right. it. Um, I'm, I'm more on the same page with Justine. I think like it's a grown-up like film that, that does, as you guys said, ask a lot of questions and gives you a lot of food for thought for discussion afterwards. I thought the cast was outstanding, but there are a lot of plot flaws. I do agree with you both on that, too. But I, I would recommend the film. Well, Loose takes place in a high school, and with fall just around the corner, that means, among other things, that the kids are going back to school. So we thought it would be a good time to look at some classic school-themed movies. Let's take a look at a few. To with love. Okay, you're on, Mr. Popular. You might think it upset me that Paul Metzler had decided to run against me, but nothing could be further from the truth. Quarter the double cheese and sausage. Right here, dude. <laughs> Dude. So you've actually never been to a real school before? Shut up. Shut up. I didn't say anything. Homeschooled. That's really interesting. They're gonna nail us no matter what we do. So we might as well have a good time. Toga, 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 toga. Bill, hit me with a school theme movie. Well, I don't know if this is the definitive one, but it's certainly the definitive launching pad for so many careers. It's Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which in 1982 was directed by Amy Heckerling, written by Cameron Crowe, and starred Sean Penn, Jennifer Jason Lee, Judge Reinhold, Phoebe Cates, Taylor Negron, and some new kid named Ray Walston. 
Uh, <laughs> this was absolutely where a lot of careers got started. And if it's not the best movie about high school, it's certainly one of them. Sean Penn was such a good stoner in that that until he started doing other roles, I think if that was like the way the guy was. Right. He's just so great in that. Awesome! Totally awesome! Lisa, what do you got? Clueless, also Amy Heckerling. Like, man, does she cornered the market on the good high school movie. In my opinion. John Hughes. Uh, well, different topic. This is, to me, the best 90s high school movie. Uh, it's an Emma reboot. It's just a, it's a crazy cast, and it's so clever. And may I say, the clothes are so good. Yeah, and... Um, Alicia Silverstone. I yeah, love her. Alicia. And Paul Rudd. And Paul Rudd. We love Paul, Paul Rudd. Rudd. He was like a rom-com hero. This here. guy never we gets love, old. Never no, ages. No, it's like never. amazing. Justine, go ahead. Well, speaking of a film that launched a lot of careers, I have to add Dead Poets Society. Okay. Oh, Captain, my captain. Captain, my captain. Ethan Hawke, Josh Charles, and of course, Robin Williams in one of his most beloved roles. I love Robin Williams when he's doing not comedy. I think he's at his best when he's doing serious And he roles. sticks to a script, which uh. he obviously did here. Yeah, okay. Well, um, my favorite, this might be my all-time favorite high school movie, is Election. Reese Witherspoon, never better, as Tracy Flick, this girl that's going to go to any means possible to, like, win this, like, high school election. Alexander Payne, so probably good. his best film. And Matthew Broderick, it's funny how Matthew Broderick went from this cool guy, we're gonna talk about Ferris Bueller in, in a minute, to like playing these nerdy roles. Like he's this nerdy guy here, he was a nerdy guy in the producers, like what a career change. I love Election. And speaking of Ferris Bueller. Uh, <laughs> well, Ferris Bueller. Well, that's a classic. That's, I mean, the, that's a John Hughes like definitive high school movie. Absolutely, and this is the movie that absolutely, well, the, the best rendition of Donkishin, much better than. <laughs> uh, and by the way, fun fact that uh, Ferrari that they steal and, and runs uh, down into the back of the house, fake, it was a kit car. It's actually made of fiberglass. Lisa? I also love Matt Mean Matt Girls. Matt. Tina Fey wrote it. Uh, so the Mathletes. Yeah, exactly. She co-stars. This is back when, before Lindsay Lohan got a little cray-cray, uh, when she plays a, a transfer student from Africa who's been homeschooled and has never really dealt with the wilderness that is American high school. This, you, know, you guys think about it. This film broke out so many careers, actually. Rachel McAdams, Amanda Seyfried, whose name I never say right, Lizzie Kaplan. Everybody's in this film. And Tina Fey proved she could move from television to motion pictures. And Amy Poehler plays the best, worst mom ever. In yeah, this. Justine. I have to go in a very different direction and say Carrie... Like, oh, so good. One of few horror the films. The original one? Or the, Brian yes. De Palma's <laughs> Carrie. Yeah. It's one of few oh, horror films that I think not only house. holds up over time, but has a very meaningful Crazy relevance mother. as time. There were Oscar nominations yeah. out of that movie. Piper Laurie got nominated. Piper also, Laurie is the wacko mom. Is so amazing so in that amazing. film. And I have to say, I saw that in the theaters when it came out, like in the it was scary. 70s. And the entire theater screamed at the end of that movie. If you haven't seen the movie, Rent also, this movie. You guys and we've heard Neil and scream, and it's blood curdling. Young, yeah. young Travolta in this is crazy. Nancy crazy. Allen, there are tons of PJ Souls. Sissy Spacek has telekinesis and doesn't so know what good. to do with it. It's just, it's just phenomenal. Mom, please, don't talk to me. Come on, get him, please, and talk to me. You know, there's a lot of movies where the teacher comes in and he inspires the bunch of unruly rough kids and you know dangerous minds and lean on me and uh, school of rock, school of rock. And richard and linklater school of rock. And, and deliver. this is richard, richard but linklater but the, fir the first one was to sir with love with sydney Poitier. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, although and a little dated, I think that's the one that kind of started that whole Mr. Holland's Opus thing. You can go on and on, but To Serve with Love was the first one. And Sidney Poitier, that performance is still powerful. And Lulu, who's in the movie, is one of the rough high school kids in love. So in the funny, London I forgot about then, that. Uh, sings that great, great hit song. And you were just saying... Oh, well, School of Rock. School of Rock, School of Rock. With, uh, Jack Black, again, Richard Linklater, uh, one of his sort of first directing assignments that wasn't his own film. You got Mike White, who co-wrote, Joan Cusack. Sarah Silverman's in this thing, mm -hmm. and a little Miranda Cosgrove. You know, he's a heavy metal guitarist. He's a sub at this school, and he takes the class, and they win a count. Honestly, this is the best contest. use of Jack Black. It is. It's the best, the best Jack, use Black of Jack, Black Jack Black performance. Yeah. It is like he's enthusiastic. He's into music. Yeah. It's like, it, I, I agree. He lets him off the leash, and he's perfect. All you bullies get out of my way, because I am really ticked off. Justine. Continuing in the musical vein, I'm going to have to include fame in this. Just I want to live forever. <laughs> the way it captures 80 youth <laughs> culture, just such a dynamic cast. You can watch it.
time and time again. Unbelievable talent in that film. Well, yeah, it feels dated to me. I caught a little of it the other night when I was flipping around, and I thought maybe these kids aren't going to live forever. The best. Scene, I love it. The best scene in that movie is in the beginning when they're auditioning for that performing arts high school in right. New York, and one girl goes, "I'm going to do the scene from Towering Inferno where OJ gets like waiting for the elevator." <laughs> I think that is just hilarious. You no, know, and also you guys, it's a time capsule of New York before exactly. it got all you know Disneyfied. It's amazing. I like the movie Friday Night Lights, which takes place in Odessa, Texas, and the entire town revolves, their lives revolve around these Friday night football games with their high school football team. Uh, I think the television series was better. They were both done by Peter Berg, but the movie is really quite good, and um, I, I recommend the television series and the movie if you want to check that. something out. So good. That's yeah. a lot of so binge good. watching, but you know, I know you have a lot of time on you your guys, hands. You guys, you know what hasn't aged well, and I just want to say this out loud, is Breakfast Club. I put John Hughes on such a pedestal, but now when I watch that film, it is very problematic in terms of date rape stuff and sexual assault. Like, you don't necessarily have to show this one to your kids, in my opinion. I don't know. I like School Ties which is uh, Brendan Fraser in the 1950s. He gets a scholarship to play on a high school team in a preppy school, and uh, he faces a lot of anti-Semitism. And you know, Dick Wolf, who created all those law and orders, this was uh, written by him, and it was based on his personal experience. All right, Bill, we were talking about Animal House in the green room before this started. Well, we, you wonder where all these nerds went after high school. They went to college, and they went to Animal House, the Delta House. And this is the definitive John Landis film with the great John Belushi. Is. And one quotable scene after another after another. I'm a zit. Get it? That sort of sums everything up. There you go, and that's a look at some school theme movies. Now, there are a bunch of recent films that you might have missed when they were in theaters a few months ago, but now they're either streaming, going to be streaming soon, or on demand, or coming to DVD. And one of those is Shaft. This is the third movie called Shaft. The first was in 1971, the second in 2000, but there were also many sequels along the way, and this one features three generations of Shaft. It stars Samuel L. Jackson as Shaft, Jesse T. Usher is his son, and the original Shaft, Richard Roundtree, is in this too. It's an action comedy with the emphasis on comedy. It's sort of a parody, and going into this, I didn't expect that as un-PC of a movie as this is, in this era of Me Too, if you can get past that, Why which, would you get past which asks a lot, that it is pretty funny taken for what it is. And I think what makes this funny is Samuel L. Jackson, who does have comedic chops. He demonstrated that in Pulp Fiction. And would I pay full price at the box office for this? No way. But streaming, uh, why not? Uh, you're shaking your head. This is bad idea jeans. It's not just an unnecessary remake, it's an insultingly bad remake. Do you like it? Yeah, it's so good. I hate it. Hashtag really? me too, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it, when you said emphasis on comedy, like where and why? I mean, comedy. The Shaft, the Shaft uh, franchise is so cool when it's cool, but funny isn't cool, and I felt bad for Richard Roundtree. Like, he actually blazed the trail to make this cool, crossed over to white audiences, and now he has to show up for this. He looked trapped. Yeah. I, Justine? I don't think we needed another installment after the late John Singleton's version in 2000. I think the only redeeming quality is that it embraces its camp, and it at least there is a clash between these old, archaic, problematic views and a fresher, modern perspective. Well, I went up to Harlem and sat down with the stars of Chef on location at the famed Red Rooster restaurant. Let's take a look. Why was the decision made, and it works, to make it, you know, like a comedy action film? When I talked to John Davis, he strictly wanted to make a comedy. And I was going, no, you can't just do a comedy with Shaft in it. He's mm. not a buffoon, and there's a lot of mythology that goes along with being this character. So if it's anything, it has to be an action comedy. And the action part has to be very dangerous. It can't mm -hmm. be hokey. What's it like playing Shaft and, and you inheriting the throne of being Shaft Jr., basically? Oh, my gosh. It, it feels great inheriting the throne and still having these two gentlemen alongside me. Like, that was, was the, the moment for me. What's different shooting on the streets of New York now as opposed to 1970, 71? To be real, <clears throat> with gentrification in Harlem, that has been the main change. I have, in my childhood, <laughs> never seen so many white people in Harlem. <laughs> we in Harlem? <laughs> For real? This is what's happening now? Finally, there's a new documentary on demand called Be Natural about an unsung pioneer of cinema, Lisa. 
Uh, well, this is actually about Elise Guy Blachet, who, born in 1891, was one of the first female filmmakers. Essentially, she was a studio chief, a producer, and a director. When this film focuses on the fact that she was overlooked and, and shows us the kind of background and how they found out more about her, it is an extremely boring film, even though it's a very worthy topic. But what it actually focuses on this woman's, uh, kind of like, resurrects her place in the cinema canon and shows us her film footage, shows us what she actually did. It's fascinating, and I wish there was more of that in this documentary. I can't believe you find it boring because the subject matter is straight up your alley, and I hate to take your side on this, but I think it's almost criminal what's happened to this woman yes, in terms of the history. Yes, nobody's heard of this woman. No, 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 she's stars fascinating, it's like but this if, documentary if said, is the wrong documentary to resurrect her well, role in okay, history. Okay, if you want a better uh, movie to see, it's called uh, Gamont Treasures. Yes, that is a better movie. In 1913, yes, that is because better. it features a bunch of her films. But I think to anybody who has never heard of this woman, I recommend the documentary. Yeah, you really get a sense that the people behind this film were so passionate about the topic. It's a great overview of the innovations in early cinema. It does have a somber tone, despite the lightheartedness throughout, where you realize like she wasn't recognized for her innovations in her time. You know, she died in squalor. And now we finally, all this time later, have a celebration of what she contributed. It's such a bad documentary. I think it's though. fascinating the fact that this woman was this unbelievable innovator in the world of cinema, and because she was a woman, she's been relegated to like they have all these people like Peter Farrelly and all these other Peter Bogdanovich. Nobody ever heard of this woman. But right. don't you think it's a little ironic that she was such a good filmmaker and they made such a bad film about her? I, I don't mean, think I it's such a bad film. More fascinating I didn't than need you to did. see I this much it. information about people calling up like their orthodontist brother and having to listen to the phone calls in which they tried to find out more about her. I don't know. So it, badly it done. It could have been a better it was documentary. Like a line but, and I don't know who this Ugh. would appeal to, to be quite honest with you, other, if you're not a student of film or a film buff. If you're a film but, buff, then you'd be like feeling the way I did, which is I wish there was a better film about this amazing Well, woman. I'm glad that her story will now be taught in schools and we're bringing this woman to light. And that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Lisa Rossman and I want to thank Bill McCuddy and I want to thank Justine Browning and I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures. <laughs>